and uh, welcome everybody. <coughs> now, I was first asked to introduce Jay. I was a little bit puzzled, I guess, as to why I was being asked, because I am no longer in one of his home departments, and I'm not a, a writer, for example, uh, but I was quite tickled to be asked and jumped at the chance, partly because I have a great deal of respect for Jay as an instructor and as a writer and as a colleague, and also I think probably because I thought, oh yeah, it's about the Amundsen thing, we share Viking blood, I better do this. <laughs> um, so I got really excited about the exploration angle and opened up a little file on my iPad and started making all kinds of notes about, you know, African exploration and boyhood stories of the Klondike that I remembered, the Kantiki expedition, and reality TV shows, and links to colonialism, and imperialism, and gender studies, and, well, it was spinning out of control, as you can see, and I was actually preparing a presentation rather than introducing a presentation. Um, I did go down to Victoria to the Royal Museum to see the uh, really neat exhibit called Race to the South Pole, which had a direct uh, connection to this uh, journey that Jay undertook, and also, you know, either reminded me of or introduced me to a whole level of detail that uh, I wasn't aware of in terms of that. Uh, it was very much presented as a competition between Scott, the British explorer, and his team, and Amundsen, the Norwegian explorer, and his team, and the things that, you know, uh, might have gone right or wrong for either one of those uh, explorers. So anyway, <clears throat> after I reined in my own enthusiasm and said, hey, I've got to introduce this talk, um, I do want to make one uh, reference to a literary source, since most people, in most cases, others say things better than I ever could. And this has to do with uh, something that I recently did, a recommendation of my 13-year-old Emily. She had seen a movie and come home just just raving about it. Oh, God, you guys got to see this movie. It's really cool, blah, blah, blah. Well, what was the movie? It was The Great Gatsby. So she and her friend had uh, watched the new version of The Great Gatsby on pay-per-view, and they watched it twice. And I just thought, well, I haven't seen the movie. Not a big deal, a DiCaprio fan, blah, 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 but I was just really cool. I was really glad that she was so pumped about something. So I sat down and watched the movie with her, and uh, at the end of the movie, they did a voiceover with some of the language from the end of the novel. And that's what I want to read to you, because this was the one thing that I thought I would save from my tons and tons of notes. And many of you will remember this. It's uh, Nick sort of reflecting on um, Gatsby and all of the uh, stuff that's been going on through that summer. He says, uh, I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. Its vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory, enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history, with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. And I just really like the way that that describes you know, awe-inspiring natural settings and the interplay that they have with the human imagination. And uh, so that was the one thing that I wanted to say. So I've known Jay Rzeski since 1990 when he started teaching for the then Alspina. Uh, first, of course, we were departmental colleagues in the Department of English. Uh, Jay also teaches in creative writing and he's taught some of our film studies courses over the years as well. So he's a very uh, multi-talented individual. Because he spent most of his time at our Duncan campus, I would only see him once or twice a year. So he'd show up at departmental meetings and, uh, you know, his contributions were always positive and I think also sort of calming and, uh, you know, when we needed it, even rational. Um, <coughs> there might be a little bit of a historical subtext. Um, the 
closest we probably worked together was when Jay was serving as the university programs coordinator at the college and campus, and I was the dean. And uh, I started to refer to him as the Uber chair because you know he was responsible for all of the programming in all departments uh, down in Duncan, and therefore had to liaise with a number of departmental chairs as well as the faculty deans up here in the Lamo campus. So we got a little bit of a kick out of that title. Uh, of Uber chair. Um, but he is an accomplished and published writer, and in addition to his written account of this uh, exploration, um, I'm just going to read through a couple of the notes that Jay provided. His novel about a medieval monumental astronomical clock is called the Rosenberg Clock, was shortlisted for a read at the wars and for the City of Victoria Butler Book Prize. Uh, his poems and stories have appeared in Canadian and American journals such as Caliban, Prism, Canadian Lit, uh, Event, Saturday Night, Descant, Border Crossings, etc., etc., The Globe and Mail, Toronto Star. He's also got three books of poetry, Blue Himalayan Poppies, Painting the Yellow House Blue, and Am I Glad to See You, and a long essay on the writing process called Writing on the Wall. He's also worked closely with the Malahide Review for many, many years. And uh, is currently working on way too many projects at once, including an essay about driving around in a Lamborghini, which sounds pretty cool to me. Um, a novel about things that go up, a blues opera, a one man play about the cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev, and a sequel to In Antarctica. And I just want to say, in closing, that I was Jay's dean when he was planning this uh, expedition. And I, he came to me in order to get, you know, certain supports and commitments uh, uh, so that he could line up his leave and, and try to get as much in place as he could. And I probably just sort of looked at him and said, wow, that sounds like a really cool project. And I'm really glad that you pulled it off. So, cheers, Esther. Thank you for that, uh, that nice introduction, and uh, and also those those supports you were talking about were pretty important to me. I received. I want to thank the Vancouver Island University, in fact, because I received some research and support that helped get me down there. And, and the role Steve plays was quite a bit bigger than he said he could have said no to a lot of things that I wanted to do, and said he said yes, and that was uh, that was hugely helpful to me. So thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank the uh, the whole Arts and Humanities Colloquium. Committee. It's a huge amount of work you do off the side of your desks to make uh, this whole series of talks happen. And so I really appreciate you doing all of that work, and I'm grateful for it. Uh, so the the, um, the the title of my talk today is uh, uh, um, is Amundsen then and now the end of the age of heroic exploration. And uh, I speak to you this morning as a as a writer and not as an explorer. Uh, I um, uh, that that's my role. I do have this historical tie to uh, the famous Norwegian explorer, Roald Amundsen. He's my great-grandfather's cousin. And uh, since Amundsen himself never had any direct descendants, he, did, he never married, and he didn't have any children of his own. So uh, our family always felt a little bit more of a claim you know, to, be, to be descended. And all families, I think, find ways to tie themselves to fame. And Amundsen was our easy way of, of uh, tying himself to fame. Um, <laughs> so, um, I grew up uh, thinking that he was something like a god, or certainly a hero, and uh, being told stories of his explorations, and being told stories of his successes, and, and, uh, and feeling a pretty direct connection to those things. So some of the things that were his accomplishments, and many of you probably know this list, but uh, he was the, the first to uh, successfully navigate all the way through the Northwest Passage from 1903 to 1906 in the ship at Yoa. He, um, he, he froze in on the ice and, and navigated all the way through the Northwest Passage, accomplishing what uh, generations of, of uh, explorers before him had not managed to do. Uh, a couple of decades later, he circumnavigated he, uh, navigated the Northeast Passage, which was a much longer, arduous, and, and not so successful trip, but he made it all the way through the Northeast Passage. So he became the first person to circumnavigate the Arctic. And in 1926, 
he uh, flew over the North Pole in a dirigible called the Norga, and uh, and so became the first. Now he's known as the first uncontested explorer to reach the North Pole. The Americans, uh, Cook and Peary, have both claimed to reach the pole with the North Pole in 1989. Um, although it's most people agree now that neither one of them quite made it. Peary was probably a little bit closer, but uh, but neither one of them likely made it all the way to the pole. So their their accomplishments are a little bit contested, and, and Amundsen for sure flew over in 1926. His famous accomplishment, though was to reach the South Pole December the 14th, 1911, with a small team of men, and uh, uh, and he achieved priority doing that. He was the first ever to get there. And and at least in Antarctica, you can say fairly safely, he was the first human being ever to set foot on the South Pole, because, uh, at the South Pole, because there weren't any other human beings living down there. So so it's pretty safe to uh, um, depending on geology, maybe, but, uh, but roughly that's how it goes. So, I grew up uh, in the in the Vietnam era. I grew up in in what we what I loved actually to think about is the space age. And so, my it's probably my earliest memory, and I, I feel really lucky that this is my earliest memory. But probably my earliest memory is uh, of being allowed to stay up late and watch Neil Armstrong land on the moon. So that's kind of, that's when I was growing up, and and um, uh, and as I was growing up. Other kids, because it was the Vietnam era and the space age, other kids were playing with GI Joes or um, or pretending to be Captain Kirk and things like that. And I was hitching my stuffed animals to makeshift sledges and, and setting on arduous expeditions to the attic with boxes of Ritz crackers as supplies and stuff like that. Um, and, and and imagining myself as a, as an Antarctic explorer. So. Um, uh, Part of my experience uh, growing up was in northern Ontario and Alberta, and I felt that I was no stranger to the, my Norwegian heritage. I felt like I knew what winter was. That's me over there, that's my sister, it's the uh, Thunder Bay. So I, I knew what I knew about snow, and I knew about minus 30 degree temperatures, and, um, and, and I felt that that explorer heritage was a deep part of myself. So when I imagined that whole idea of, uh, of uh, exploration. I imagine something like this. Uh, this is a guy named Helmer Hansen, who's one of Amundsen's men. And uh, it's a photograph from the Bram expedition. This is somewhere uh, uh, near Bramheim on the Bay of Wales, where the, the Bram expedition set off from. And there he is, you know, dressed in his furs with his trusty team of uh, Greenland Huskies, ready to pull them all the way back to the and this photograph for me speaks to the whole idea of the heroic age of exploration. And to, to define that a little bit, what that, what that means to me is that for several centuries, people were setting out uh, for one thing, one way or another to stake claims or uh, find wealth or make scientific observations and discoveries and they were setting out really into what was for them the complete unknown in order to try to do these things. And it was a, a heroic feat to set out and do that. So in the north, you might begin with somebody like Eric the Red, who was uh, was sent into exile and, and uh, landed in Greenland and ended up establishing himself there in about 983. So heroic exploration in the north begins a little bit earlier than in the south, and, and that's what, what he set out. In the South, you could debate a little bit, but I would probably date that whole age of heroic exploration from something like Cook's expedition to the South in 1772, uh, where he managed to get all the way across the Antarctic Circle. And he, he never sighted land. He didn't make it uh, close enough. He was very close to the continent, but he, but he never really was in sight of the continent. He did, though, see icebergs and other evidence that suggested to him that, um, that there was some land there, some sort of a continent uh, that was was there to be found. So the heroic age of the South probably begins with him. Um, these explorers were, were really truly setting out into the unknown. Um, up until the very end of the, the 19th century, Antarctica was represented on maps and usually labeled terra incognita, the unknown land, and, and it was truly unknown right, right until the end of the, uh, the 19th century. 
there was quite a lot of sealing and whaling going on through the 19th century, starting quite early in the 19th century. But sealers and whalers didn't have to go any farther than they had to to get whales and seals. And so, um, so until the, the, the early 20th century, there was still a big question about what was in the middle. Uh, there was we knew that there was a continent uh, or there was land around the edges, but nobody knew whether that land was a series of islands or um, or a, 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 a sort of a donut of land with a big ocean in the middle. It wasn't quite clear until the first um, uh, the first expeditions inland uh, told us about that. And one of the things that Antarctica still is is it is an isolated, uh, imposing landscape that's hostile to human life. The interior temperatures there in the winter drop well below minus 50 degrees Celsius. And one of the things that's clear to me is that it would be very easy, to, and always has been very easy, to die in Antarctica. Um, Amundsen and explorers like him were traveling to get there in wood-hulled ships in some of the, well, the roughest oceans in the world. Um, the, the, this is a photograph of uh, the helm of Fram. Fram was a 129-foot wooden sailing boat. Uh, it was motorized, but they were sitting under sail most of the time. So 129-foot boat, and the seas in the Arctic Ocean, in Antarctic Ocean uh, often in storms reach 30 feet or even more, 40 feet. So you can imagine what that's like in a 129-foot wooden ship. Um, and, um, uh, and how seasick you would get if you were uh, these guys. The other thing is that once they got where they were going, uh, after sailing for something like uh, 24,000 kilometers, they had to figure out how they were going to get the rest of the way. So Amundsen landed at uh, the Bay of Wales, which was uh, on the Ross Ice Shelf, uh, the Ross Ice, the Ross Sea, and uh, it was this, it was the southernmost point of open ocean in the world uh, for a very long time, and uh, and that's where he landed. And what they still had to do was they had to get the 1,600-kilometer round trip, 800 there, 800 back, to the South Pole. And in order to do that, what that meant was landing at the, the Bay of Wales, setting up a base there. And then, um, and then, with men and dogs taking the supplies they needed across the right Ross Ice uh, Shelf, where no one had been before, up across the Trans Antarctic Mountains, that they weren't even sure that there was a way to get up the Trans Antarctic Mountains, and to the South Polar Plateau, which is uh, at an elevation of 3,000 meters, so it's three kilometers thick ice, and they had to get all the way up there with all their stuff and their dog. And uh, to, to make the rest of the trek to the pole and, and get back. So, um, so it's an understatement, I guess, to say that part of the heroic age of exploration was that it was hard <laughs> to do any of the things that they were doing. Um, one of the elements of Amundsen's success as a polar explorer was that he learned a lot from the northern Inuit on that trip uh, through the Northwest Passage. He learned about, uh, arc, about proper Arctic clothing, things that would actually keep him warm. Uh, one of the differences between the British expedition and the, the Norwegian one is that the Norwegians were wearing uh, reindeer fur and, and, and uh, wolf skin uh, parkas, and, and the British were wearing belt and, um, and wool and trying to keep themselves warm that way. The biggest thing that he learned was uh, the importance of dogs, how to work with dogs, and, uh, and, and how, how important dogs can be to get you the 800 kilometers you needed to go to the pool at that. Um, so, so part of what I was doing in, when I came back uh, writing this book in Antarctica was, was, um, was, was trying to talk about my own, um, my own trip to the um, to Antarctica, and I'm going to talk about that a bit. But the other thing I was trying to do is uh, sort of honor Amundsen's story. Amundsen is, is, is kind of generally revered among, among people who are still interested in polar exploration of the poles as, um, as, as probably the preeminent polar explorer. I mean, his successes have testified to that. Um, but, but he wasn't necessarily the greatest storyteller. A lot of my research involved reading his diaries and reading uh, the published, his published work. And, and uh, he was a savvy enough guy to know that, that part of what he needed to do in his published work uh, through the South Pole, for example, is creating a two-volume tome uh, that documents his trip. And what he does is mention a lot of his sponsors quite often. There's a lot of sort of product placement in the and everything. 
good. And uh, 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 so one of the things I was trying to do was retell his story using the tools that I had in the best way that I possibly could and trying to honor that, that I felt like I was trying to honor that family story. So I wanted to read you just a little passage. I'll read you a couple of passages as I go. And I wanted to read you a short passage about the dogs. Um, Amundsen took 97 dogs with him uh, from, from Norway. They were brought from Greenland and they, they were loaded up with a ship uh, in Norway. And they sailed all the way to the um, to Antarctica on the tram. And the crew was a little mystified when they took all the dogs on because, as some of you may know, Amundsen had been planning a, an expedition to the North Pole and he didn't tell anybody that he changed his plans until they were on the way. He didn't even tell the crew that he changed his plans until they were on the way. They, the last stop was uh, at Madeira, Portugal, and uh, just before taking off from there, he got the crew together and said, well, actually, we're at the South Pole. So anybody who doesn't want to farm there, this is the chance. You can go now, no shade in the evening now. Um, and, and they all, you know, clapped their heads. You know, how stupid we've been because we have 97 dogs on board, and, and, and they, what they thought is they were going to be sailing all the way down around the tip of uh, South America and up to Alaska, which was going to be their starting point. And why would they take all these dogs across the equator twice? Why does it get them in Alaska? So they felt kind of stupid when they were when they were finally the plan was revealed. Um, but you can imagine something uh, uh, what it means to have 97 dogs on board a 129 foot uh, wooden ship. At first, the dogs were um, were chained to the deck, all in place. Uh, but uh, but before too long. They set them free because they wanted them to have to, they, it wasn't healthy for them to just be chained up for you know, 24,000 kilometers. So, uh, so this is a little moment where they set the dogs free. Hassel reached for Ring, then Zanko, Bias, Karenas, Sound, Schwartz, Lucy, Crone, and finally Kiri, named for the man who had recently claimed to have made the North Pole. He waited to see how the dogs would react to having been liberated. One of them strolled past another still chained dog as if to taunt it, and it snarled viciously and lunged. Fighting is both a way to establish order among them and a sport, and so their month-long abstinence erupted in a fury. Before long, the rest of the dogs had been released so that the deck was awash with them. Gray, white, black, and brown fur surged in waves as they battled into the hitherto unreachable corners of the deck. Bits of fur were tossed around like thick cotton but the muzzles prevented them from doing any serious damage to each other. The tempest raged for two hours. Some dogs stood off against each other while others formed alliances and attacked and packed. The men watched it happen, their adrenaline rushing like spectators at a boxing match. They positioned themselves along the edges of the deck to prevent the frenzied animals from forcing each other overboard. In the weeks gone by, they had noticed that some of the dogs they noticed that some of the dogs seemed unusually shy or depressed. As the fury mounted, crested, and started to abate, they understood the restlessness of those particular dogs. <coughs> Allowed to roam freely, the dogs located old friends from whom they had been separated. Tails wagged when they yapped to the best of their ability against the muzzles. Their spirits seemed to soar with the reunions. And then finally there was calm. In a few days, the muzzles would also be removed, and the dogs would have the freedom there is on board a ship. They would, get, they would get what exercise they could exploring the deck, and when they were finished poking their noses into the margins of the balance, they circled themselves several times, tucked their noses into their bellies, and went to sleep. And they are uh, resting on the deck of the ship. Um, so, immediately, going back to that image of myself and my team of huskies, um, uh, that image, one of, the, one of the problems with that image for me is that as part of the environmental protocol of the Antarctic Treaty, all non-indigenous species, both flora and fauna, all non-indigenous species have been banned in Antarctica since, uh, since 1994. So the last dogs were removed from Antarctica um, in, in 94, and, uh, and dogs are no longer allowed. Dogs have been had almost 100 year history working in Antarctica and they were replaced by snowmobiles and snowcats and other machines which were also working there, but the, no more dogs are allowed. So that, that's one part of that image of myself that right away was changed. Dogs aren't allowed there anymore. Um, another aspect of the heroic age of exploration is that danger of heading off into the unknown. Um, when Amundsen went south, he laid depots as far south as he could in the, in the, in the late uh, sort of Antarctic fall so that 
when and then they overwintered and when spring came they could leave uh, and head out for the pool and there would be the, the depots that they could uh, resupply themselves on the way there and on the way back and they would have to haul absolutely everything all the way to the pool and back. Um, the last depot that they set was at 82 degrees south in, in the fall and so when they, in the spring, when they made their start and they got to that last depot and set off from there, heading due south, they were truly heading out into the unknown. They had absolutely no idea what was in, in front of them. No one had ever taken the route that they were taking, and, uh, and, and it was a complete unknown. So they, uh, they set off across the, the Ross Ice Shelf and uh, hoped that they were going to get where they were going and that they would find a way up, um, up the plateau. I want to reach another little section um, that's from early on in, in Amundsen's, uh, Amundsen's trek south. And this is a part of the early start that almost ended the expedition uh, after just a, a couple of weeks. They were running through a blizzard, so visibility was poor, and wind whipped snow against the men and dogs. Amundsen, riding with Wisting at the end of the caravan, saw Bjallan's sledge lift, list over hard. Bjallan left, left off it, grabbing the traces and digging in. The dogs, sensing danger, sank low on their bellies and dug their claws desperately into the ice. The sledge held 880 pounds of supplies, and although Bjallan and the dogs all strained against the tug of gravity, the sledge slipped lower into the opening crevasse until it disappeared from sight. Because they were traveling in such bad weather, the other two sledges were not too far ahead. Both Hassel and Hansen rushed back to the scene, and Hassel managed to attach a climbing rope to the sledge. The tip was just even with the top of the crevasse. With Amundsen and Bjorn and the dogs all holding tight, they managed to keep the loaded sledge suspended above the abyss. But it slipped farther so that it hung from a rope like an amulet spinning slowly in the air. Hassel was able to make a bridge with his sledge across the narrowest part of the crevasse, and they tied the rope to it so that the dogs and Amundsen and Bjorn could be released from the strain of holding up the sledge. Wind continued to bite into them. Wisting volunteered to be lowered into the crevasse so that the hanging sledge could be unloaded and the supplies could be hauled back up to the surface, crate by crate. Amundsen and Bjallan held the rope and let him sink down like a city worker, descending below the streets to check pipes. Hansen and Hassel pulled up the supplies bit by bit until the unloaded sledge could be ripped back up to the surface. There was a huge relief when Wisting was brought back to the ice deck, riding the rope like a circus acrobat. It was really nice and warm down there, he said. <laughs> um, so one of the things about that, uh, that particular uh, sledge was that it, it, it held their only primus stove, which was essential for melting the snow to drink for drinking water, for all of their drinking water, and cooking all of their food. So had that sledge dropped off to the bottom of that crevasse, that would have been it. They would have made it further. Um, but made it they did. Um, on December the 14th, 1911, uh, Amundsen and four other men stood at the South Pole, and they returned to tell the world about it. They uh, made it uh, quickly back to Framheim after spending a couple of days there. One of the things Amundsen did was very carefully uh, um, uh, made about a 12 kilometer sort of square around uh, the uh, South Pole because it's very hard to. Um, to, to, to get readings at the South Pole in the summer, the sun draws directly overhead. So, so knowing exactly where we are geographically isn't easy. So he made very sure that he at least kind of crossed over. He didn't want to be um, accused of not making it all the way there after uh, the, the success of getting there. So they made it all the way back to Framheim, packed up the ship in about two days, and sailed for, uh, for uh, Hobart, Tasmania, and, and announced to the world that they had made it to the South Pole. This was March 1912 by the time they made it back and the cables went out and everybody realized how about that. The, the Norwegians had been successful. So in a way, after this accomplishment, after Amundsen and his uh, men arrived at the South Pole, this, this marked the end of the age of heroic exploration. Um, after the South Pole had been attained, or claimed, or whatever um, phrase you want to use. After somebody got there, 
there was really no place left on Earth, at least no place as uh, important in the popular imagination for anyone to go. I mean, there's still, you know, deep, deep down in the ocean and things like that. But, but in terms of the popular imagination, this was the last place there was for anybody to get to. And the only place left was the moon. And, you know, as I said, you we know, talked about growing up. It was quite a long way off before anybody was going to be able to get to the moon. So, so we could, we could label the end of the age of, ex of heroic exploration as when these guys were standing at the pool. But part of the reason is because they got to the South Pole. But part of the other reason is because the circumstances in the world changed rather drastically after this period, after 1911 and 12. And, uh, and you know what those are. I mean, first of all, uh, most closely related to, to this event, uh, Robert Puppet Scott and his men arrived at the pole in the backgrounds and but died on the way back. And so it was a whole year later, it was 1913, before uh, a search party could go up and find them and bring back the news that they had died. And, uh, and when, when their death was discovered and announced, they were mourned all around the world and became sort of martyrs of, uh, of heroic exploration. And, um, and the other thing that was happening, of course, was that the First World War was heating up. And in the face of the, the drama that was the First World War, the idea of kind of poking around the edges of the, of the Earth seemed sort of less important, I think, than, than what was happening um, in, in Europe. So there was that. The other thing that happened at the beginning of the century was that while these expeditions were going on, the inventions were happening everywhere. Uh, uh, Amundsen's expedition, they took with them something called a, a thermos that had just been recently invented, a vacuum uh, thermos, and it had been invented for uh, keeping gases, but they, but they were using it to keep hot liquids warm. Um, and they thought it was almost a miracle that they could you know, sort of trek for four and a half hours and then, and then stop. And instead of unpacking it and getting the stove out, melting some water, and everything that they had melted, they had chocolate that they could just drink and keep going. And they thought it was absolutely amazing. And all those kind of miracles, the automobile, the airplane, that was all happening at the same era. So those things changed. Uh, changed the whole idea of exploration really dramatically. And in fact, Abinson played a big part of that in his later years following his uh, South Pole expedition. He, he, he sent out on a couple of more expeditions, this one to the north in another ship where he sort of navigated, or navigated the Northeast Passage. But even he recognized that what he was doing was kind of unloaded and outdated. And uh, before too long, he shifted his, his mode of exploration to air travel to, to explore by plane and then by airship. So he, he recognized that this was the way of the future and what he had been doing was no longer really relevant. So a um, hundred years after Amundsen arrived in Antarctica, I was adult and writing and still fascinated by the whole idea of Antarctica. And, um, and somewhere around um, when I was in graduate school in Ontario in the, the, the um, early, the late 1980s, I started thinking about writing about Antarctica. And somewhere in there, too, I started thinking about trying to go, trying to get myself there. I knew that the anniversary date was coming up. It was, at that time, way off in the future, 2011. And I thought, wouldn't it be something if I could, if I could really follow the specifics and go? And I started investigating probably uh, in the 90s. And my great hope was this program that's run by the National Science Foundation in the United States. And the NSF runs a program called the Antarctic Artists and Writers in Residence Program. <laughs> and um, the way that that works is that a very select few artists, filmmakers, writers um, uh, are selected every year to piggyback on some of the many uh, scientific expeditions that the United States uh, mounts in Antarctica every year. But, and essentially what you do is you, you, you hitch a ride on helicopters that are going here or there anyway, or there's a Hercules leaving Murdo and Hanford, Madison Scott Station at the South Pole, so an extra poet on a Hercules is no big deal, right? So it's, it's, it's pretty huge for the poet. Not, not a big deal for um, to strap in some other guy in, in Hercules. So I thought I had a hope. I contacted people at the National Science Foundation. I talked to them about, you know, I made a lot of about that family heritage and and and, uh, 
And I at least felt like there was a chance that if I made an application, you never know, maybe I could, maybe I could get there on that anniversary day. But at the time when I would need to be applying to try to go uh, to the South Pole, the global economic recession hit, and the, all kinds of programs in the States just kind of collapsed inward, and I could no longer get anyone at the Antarctic Artists and Res Residence uh, Department on the phone. Uh, emails bounced back, the website wasn't updated, there was just no way I could get in touch with anybody. And so uh, there was no way to make an application. And, uh, and so I had to give up on the idea of trying to get to the South Pole. Um, well, I didn't give up right away. The first thing I did is I started thinking, well, all right, that's not an avenue, but it's the 21st century, and I know that, that travel has changed a lot in the 21st century. If you want to get anywhere now, if, if, if you have the funds, you can go. I mean, you can pay somebody to take Yanko up Mount Everest or Mount Kilimanjaro. You can pay someone to paddle you down the Amazon. Um, there's a, a, a really interesting thing as, you know, in the future, maybe, uh, with retirement. There's, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, in, the, in Russia, there's a program where uh, you can pay to stay at a uh, fancy Moscow hotel, and then a couple of times during the week, they'll take you out on an old MiG jet and fly you up to 70 or 90,000 feet from the near to space flight, and uh, so they'll take you way up there. And, and in, in, um, in 2001, there was a, a California billionaire who paid $20 million to be taken as a tourist to the International Space Station. So really, there's no place you can't go if you have the funds. And, as I did a little bit of research, I found that Antarctica is no stranger to that whole idea of eco travel. There's a company that mounts expeditions. What they do is they fly you to within about 100 kilometers of the pole, drop you off on that uh, Antarctic plateau with a guide and skis, and they ski guide you the rest of the 100 kilometers to the South Pole, and you arrive feeling like that heroic explorer that I was uh, uh, showing a picture of before without the dogs. The only problem with that is that that costs about eighty-five thousand dollars, and so um, uh, so much as I feel you know compensated well for my job, but it was so steep uh, for me, um, and and that just wasn't an option. Um, but like Amundsen, who had to readjust his goals or reset his goals, he had always since a, 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 he was a child he wanted to go to the North Pole, and as he's planning his expeditions. Cook and Fury both claimed to have reached the pole. And so what he had to do is he had to reset his goals. He turned 180 degrees around and, and, and uh, went to the south instead. And I realized I had to reset my goals too, that, okay, I, I'm not gonna be able to make it to the south pole, but maybe I could still go to Antarctica. Maybe that would be pretty good. Maybe that would be enough. It's pretty good. And I knew also that Tourism had increased substantially in, in the South, especially after the collapse of the Soviet, uh, the, the, the sort of Soviet Empire. That what happened when when the Soviet Union collapsed is that there were all kinds of polar class ships with polar class crews who were suddenly out of work, and many of them were hired and pressed into service in the tourist industry, taking people up to the Arctic and to the Antarctic and so on. So I started looking around and seeing what I could find and figuring out how much this might cost. And I found this ship, it's called the Polar Pioneer. And uh, the Polar Pioneer is a refitted Russian research vessel. It was built in Helsinki in 1985. And uh, it holds 54 passengers, it's 235 feet long. And um, polar, what a polar class means is that this ship is uh, capable of breaking through pack ice, so it can go through about you know three meter thick pack ice without any trouble at all. Um, it's still not immune to icebergs. Nothing is immune to icebergs, but uh, uh, but it's it's pretty safe uh, traveling somewhere like the Antarctic. So I found the ship, and uh, and I called up my wealthy brother. That's the Lamborghini story. And that's another story altogether. But I called my wealthy brother. He lives in Calgary. As I needed a cabin mate to keep the expenses down, and I said, "Do you want to go to Antarctica?" And he said, "Okay." Uh, the irony, um, the irony that I reveal uh, and uh, Kelly Seegers may be in the book is that uh, my brother's name is Scott, and uh, so, <laughs> uh, so, so so there was something kind of beautiful about him coming along with me um, to to, the, to Antarctica, um, and I I got on the computer and uh, and, and uh, through email and uh, and exchanges back and forth, 
we booked passage on this ship and we're ready to go uh, to Antarctica. Um, now, Amundsen, as I said, was at the pole on December the 14th, 1911. And part of that resetting of goals for me involved a resetting of everything, including the timing, because the, where, the, where the Polar Pioneer goes, where most uh, ships like that go, is along the Antarctic Peninsula. The, the marine ecosystem there is incredibly rich, and so there's just lots to see along the Antarctic Peninsula. And, um, and, but what they have to do is they have to go in, at a time in the season, in the Aspel summer, when the pack ice is broken up. And December 14th is very early in the Aspel summer. There's still often a lot of pack ice all around the Antarctic. Antarctica. Uh, um, doubles in size in the winter. So uh, it, it, it gains about 200 million square kilometers and expands to double its size as the time ice freezes all around it and then contracts as the summer comes. So you really do need to wait for the ice to uh, ice to melt to be able to get in there. Um, and part of, part of uh, bringing my brother along was kind of a negotiation. I just wanted to go to Antarctica. He, when we talked, he said, well, I'd like to do that, but if we're going all the way down there, we have to go through South America to get there. Why not make some stops on the way? And uh, and I said, well, okay, I'm happy to make some stops. I, said, I can't afford it though. And he said, well, I'll pay for the hotel. So I said, okay, well, then I absolutely will help. <laughs> um, but what that meant is that the timing was a little bit off. And so, unlike that idea of myself, surrounded by huskies, <laughs> the leaves whispering, uh, um, Blowing uh, uh, on, on my face, the Antarctic wind blowing across the plateau and, and, and keeping frostbite. Uh, on December 14, 2011, I was on Ipanema Beach in Rio de Janeiro. About as far away from Antarctica as I thought it could be. And in fact, this was about as close as I thought it could be uh, uh, to Antarctica. Um, it was the, 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 the nice cold beer that they served on the beach in Rio. Um, and so, so at this point, I was actually a little dejected. If you believe, believe it or not, I was a little dejected being in Rio. But, um, but we made our way the rest of the way south. And as it turns out, I think that it might have been better that this is what happened to me. Um, because I wasn't the only one who wanted to be at the South Pole on the centenary of Amundsen's arrival there. Uh, in fact, lots and lots of other people wanted to be there on the centenary of the arrival. It was a huge Norwegian delegation who uh, was taken by the government down to the South Pole to be there on, the, on December 14th. And I met one of the people who was there uh, on my way back from Antarctica. On the way back, I went through a uh, 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 town called Penta Arenas in Chile. And outside of my hotel, there was parked this vehicle, um, which you can't see very clearly, but it says on the side of it, New Era, New Tools. And so this truck, this SUV, parked out in front of my hotel in Punta Arias, had broken the world speed record for driving to the South Pole. One day, 15 hours and 54 minutes. So that's a little bit like driving from here to Edmonton in the winter, but not taking the road. Right. An hour, 15, 15, uh, one day, 15 hours and 54 minutes. Um, and you might notice that I said that, uh, that they had broken the world speed record for traveling to the pole. That's because there have been about six other attempts at setting a speed record for driving to the pole. So, had I been standing at the South Pole in December 14th, imagining myself like this, um, instead I would have been at Amundsen Scott Station, the American built Amundsen Scott Station at the South Pole, surrounded by uh, literally hundreds of other dignitaries. And this bright orange SUV would have roared out at high speed, and the two guys driving would have jumped out of the heated cab uh, and, and, uh, and claimed victory. Hey, we're at the right pole. Um, so to me, uh, that would have been probably just too much for me to take I mean, in terms of my, my whole image of the idea of heroic exploration being shattered. As it turns out, uh, or the good news for me, is that. Amundsen was in Antarctica twice in his life. He was there once when he went to the South Pole. He was there another time as a young man, 25 years old. He was hired as second mate on board a ship called Belgica. And the Belgica was a, a scientific expedition that traveled down the Antarctic Peninsula and ended up 
being the first ship to overwinter in Antarctica, and some people say by mistake, I think that there was quite a bit of uh, design and plan to uh, overwinter in Antarctica, but nevertheless, they were the first ship to overwinter in Antarctica. And, um, and for me, the good news is that I followed almost precisely in those footsteps. So they weren't the footsteps that I thought I was going to be following in, but I followed in Amundsen's footsteps from the, from the Belgian expedition. And so as I traveled um, through uh, down along the Antarctic Peninsula and, and stopped at the places where we stopped, um, I was both following in Amundsen's footsteps, very aware of his presence uh, there. Every place I was seeing, he had seen. And the difference was that he had been the first one to see it. No one else had been through the, through the inside passages of the peninsula when, when the Belgica went through there. So I was seeing all these things that he had seen and, and seen them in the same sort of quiet, reverent way because there was no one else around. Um, so so my, my travels through Antarctica were very different than Amundsen's. I don't know if you can see the kayaks at the bottom of the icebergs, but the, you know, my experiences were things like kayaking among icebergs and uh, communing with penguins and, um, and things that 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 uh, that weren't so strange to you, but were very different than that experience of say the SUV rolling up um, uh, at the at the South Pole. Um, so I was really keenly aware of his presence the whole time I was there. And one of the uh, um, one of the stops that uh, that Paul the Pioneer made, um, and largely because uh, my brother and I were on board, was a stop at a little island that's called Tuhamak Island. And um, Tuhamak Island is important in, in terms of Amundsen because uh, on the Belgian expedition in uh, 1898, as they were sailing near Tuhamak Island, the ship anchored. And Amundsen and a few others went ashore with, uh, with tents and skis and some other equipment. And what they were doing is they wanted to test out the equipment. And Amundsen climbed up to the top of uh, the mountain that is Tuhamak Island and skied down and became, therefore, the first person to ski in Antarctica. And um, so this was a place where I knew he had landed, and, and, and it's, it's in his diaries, he documents going there and skiing down to Amagadan. And just off shore off to Amagadan is a small island that's called Hydruga Rocks. And Hydruga Rocks is home to a fairly large chinstrap penguin colony. And so we landed there, and I was very excited to be there to be able to see to Amagadan, this place where Amundsen had skied. Uh, more than 100 years before. Um, but when we arrived on Tuamak Island, this was the view. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so we went to shore anyway, and uh, I want to just read you a little passage about this day. Um, in the the Hydruga rocks are a collection of rocks just off Tuamak Island named after Hydruga leptonics, which is the Latin name for the leopard seal. It's a tiny island, but it's home to a chinstrap penguin colony and has a sheltered bay big enough for a zodiac to land easily. We anchor in the strait and load into the inflatables. The clouds are so low now that I can't see the rocks until we're within 100 meters of them. We make land and wander over the rocks among penguins. A few Waddell seals have also hiked their way up over the rocks to the patches of snow fire out, and they snore like middle-aged men. It begins to snow steadily and the clouds pack in just a little tighter. My camera isn't weatherproof enough for this, so it looks like I won't get any photos at all. Not only that, but I haven't even had a glimpse of the peaks Barry tells me are a short stretch across the water. The peaks that haven't since skied down over 100 years ago. If the only pleasure to be had this afternoon is to watch penguins waddle to and from the nest, then that's okay. I'll treasure the time anyhow, but I admit to disappointment. As I'm looking across to where the mystical mountains are on Tuamak Island, a little window opens high up in my line of sight. At first, I'm not sure whether I can, in fact, see snow on a peak or if it's an illusion of cloud. Yes, it's snow, and that's land. I get my camera out and snap some quick pictures before the clouds can close back in. But they don't close back in. Instead, it stops snowing, and the clouds lift so fast it's as though someone removed a tarp from the sky. The clouds simply disappear and are replaced by deep blue sky and bright sun. I keep the camera out and go photo crazy in case the light changes again just as quickly. I shoot Tuhamak Island from every vantage point I can. 
I hit penguins from 100 angles. I pose by snoozing seals and have other people photograph me. It heats up fast and I have to peel off layers. I'm sweating as I run around the rocks, capturing everything I can on camera. And now the sun is beginning to go down and the last zodiac is about to leave. I'm not the only one who's been throwing paparazzi on Hydruga rocks. Harry, who is probably the most tech crazy passenger, is getting a little more footage with his iPhone and Greg, the amateur photographer with impressive skills and a treasure chest of equipment, is still snapping away as well. Almost as soon as we're in the zodiac, the clouds come back, and by the time we're heading for the polar pioneer, I can no longer see two, hum two hummocks, and then I lose the Druga rocks in the sun in the fall. We swing by an iceberg where a young leopard seal is tormenting anxious penguins who look down from the heights of ice to see the predator circling. The seal is curious about the curious humans and lifts himself out of the water way too close to the edge of one of the boats. The zodiac lifts, lists to starboard and its passengers shift suddenly to the other side. Back on board, I spent an hour flipping through the 300 new images on my camera, and I'm still a little stunned by the coming and going of the light. I don't know what the gods look like, but I know they smiled on us this afternoon. There was this charmed, charmed day, and it really was, it opened up and closed down just as we were leaving, and it was hard uh, uh, not to believe in, in something uh, something outside happening there that made that happen. Um, so, all of this description of, of my, my travels there, wandering among penguins and, and kayaking in Antarctica and stuff, it, it, for me, it, um, it, it changed when I, as I said, when I, when I dreamed about going to Antarctica, I dreamed this heroic image of myself as the, uh, uh, the heroic explorer. And that was all put quite clearly in check by my real experiences in, in Antarctica, by modern equipment and modern travel. <laughs> um, but in some ways, Antarctica is, is vastly different than it was when those heroic explorers found it. So one of the things that's happening, as everybody knows, is that climate change is much more pronounced at the poles than it is in the rest of the world. And anyone who works along those edges will tell you that climate change is having a really drastic impact on the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, the Bay of Wales, uh, where Amundsen made his base, no longer exists at all because in 1987, a Manhattan-sized chunk of ice broke off the Ross Ice Shelf, taking the Bay of Wales with it, and sailed it, uh, and floated north to sea, and, and, uh, um, and to, to eventually melt. Um, According to the British Antarctic Survey the, and, and other scientists, the glacial, the rate of glacial flow is increasing at an alarming rate. And there is a growing threat of alien flora and fauna invasion, both on land on the continent and the, and the sub-Antarctic islands, and in the marine ecosystem under the ocean. There's all kinds of crazy things happening as the ocean and the land heat up. So, uh, so it's, it's a very different time uh, in many ways in Antarctica. In other ways, though, Antarctica is still quite like it was back in the days of heroic exploration. It's still hostile to human life. It would still be very, very easy to die there. And it is still extraordinarily beautiful. I got to experience the majesty and beauty of Antarctica, despite all of the differences between the way I got there and the way Amazon did. I still found the continent to be pristine, isolated, and full of charms. There's no infrastructure there, you don't run into anyone, and there's no flight path, no vapor trails high in the sky. And I'd like to end my talk this morning with just a, a, a passage about something else I found there, which is a kind of silence that I had not known before in my life. On Cooperville Island, I wander around a point of land and find myself alone. The nearest penguins are nesting 500 meters back, and I can hear their greetings and protests. Two kilometers away in the bay, the polar pioneer has its engine running at anchor, and I can hear the deep drumbeat of them. 
farther away, there's a growl and a thundercloud. There's a couple of tons of ice carved from a glacier into the sea. It's a fast boom of sound, followed by an echo and then resounding quiet. There is an aural landscape we are rarely aware of. The noises that make up the soundscapes we inhabit every day. In Antarctica, that soundscape expands. Without the clamor we've become so accustomed to, motorcycles, delivery trucks, radios, a river, voices, dogs barking, planes flying over distant traffic, the oral world expands. Our ears can hear for miles. A seal might bark five kilometers away, and we hear it because we can, and we know it's five kilometers away. We hear the world, and we know it is bigger than we're used to hearing, and in this way the voice of the world comes to us more clearly. We become better listeners. We understand why wild animals have good ears. Their hearing is their survival. Whether the island is Cooperville or Easter Island or Crossroads, it's a place where the spirits live because of its isolation from our other everyday worlds. No island is more isolated than Antarctica, and here the brightest spirits lounge, and here they whisper. The Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov tells of the experience of being on a spacewalk. Outside of his ship, floating in the vacuum of space, and held to the light he had known by only a thin rope, there was a deep throbbing sound that could have been the background hum of the universe. It was the very pulse of matter at its most elemental, the sound of molecules moving. And then he realized it was the sound of his own heart and the blood in his veins. He heard what his heart had to say. The first time he had an opportunity to fully hear himself, and he thought it was the voice of God. The thoughts that run through our minds like background noise, like the radio on in another room, disappear when we pay close attention to our senses, when we're tuned to the sights, sounds, textures, smells, and the world around us. We leave thinking, we leave thinking and intellect behind and approach something closer to being in a more pure way. Confronted by the stimulation that Antarctica provides, the spectacle of ice, the dance of penguins, the scent of a krill filled ocean, and the taste of a rare snowflake caught on the tongue, it becomes easier to leave the conscious, high-tech, worried life behind. And in the height of the awareness of the world, we become more conscious of ourselves. So to tune into the wilderness of Antarctica is a chance to get to know myself in a way I've never been able to in the past. And standing on the deck of the ship as we sail through a glaciated bay, where the ice that is tumbling into the sea was formed before Homo sapiens walked the earth. I'm farther away from anything I have been, and closer to myself. So I'm going to stop there.